Good afternoon, everyone. This is Len Gordon uh, at Venable. Thank you all for joining us. I'm, I'm joined today by my colleague, Deborah Bessner. We're going to be speaking about a interesting issue with the uh, jurisdiction of the Federal Trade Commission, and that is the FTC's ability to pursue cases uh, not uh, for the protection of consumers, as you would typically think about it, but also for businesses. Uh, uh, several times a year, I, I, I get questions from colleagues or, or clients. Um, does the FTC have the ability to challenge conduct that uh, is directed at businesses? And I think the answer pretty clearly is yes. And um, I thought that would be a good topic for, for one of our webinars. So that brings us here today. Uh, this is a CLE presentation. I'll be saying the secret word uh, somewhere towards the middle, so pay attention. I'll make sure I repeat it several times so that those of you who have somehow dozed off um, hear it and uh, get it so that you get your, your CLE credit. And with that, we'll get started. So the word consumer does actually uh, appear in Section 5 of the FCC Act. It, yes, Section 5 governs unfair, deceptive acts or practices in or affecting commerce. It doesn't say directed towards consumers. But if you look at the FCC website, it's the nation's consumer protection agency. The, uh, it's the Bureau of Consumer Protection, not the Bureau of Business Protection. But the FCC has expanded its, its jurisdiction here, has it it's done in other areas, uh, in, in some ways relying on bad facts in some of these cases to make uh, or to convince judges to, to take a, a rather aggressive view of what the FCC can reach. If you look at the definitions of unfairness and deception, they do stress consumers. You know, an act is unfair if it causes or is likely to cause substantial injury to consumers which is not reasonably avoidable by consumers themselves and not outweighed by countervailing benefits to consumers. And for deception, a deception, deception involves a material representation, omission, or practice that is likely to lead a consumer, not a business, acting reasonably in the circumstances. If you were to look at Black Law Dictionary, it would tell you that a consumer is someone who's doing something for personal purposes, not for business purposes. But that is um, not how the FTC has, has construed its authority. And that's different really than uh, a lot of other statutes. The CFPB Act specifically defines consumer as an individual or an agent, trustee or representative acting on behalf of an individual. The Truth and Lending Act, the Fair Debt Collection Practice, Practices Act, and several other consumer protection statutes are by their terms limited to consumers acting for personal benefit or household benefit or use, not, not for businesses. And I think one of the things that you'll see as we walk through the presentation today is that many instances what the FTC has done and continues to do is to take some of the protections in these statutes designed towards consumers and seeks to apply those protections to uh, businesses through the rather you know, elastic contours of Section 5 of the FCC Act, especially the unfairness uh, protection. So you know, can the FTC do this? Uh, a fair question. Um, and it, it is a question that has received really scant attention in the courts, uh, in 2008, a, a court adjudicated it. The court decided this was an issue of first impression. Uh, interestingly, the case was brought by the Northwest Regional Office of the FCC, and that office has actually been fairly active in bringing cases that um, involve alleged deceptive or unfair acts or practices aimed at small businesses. So uh, I confess that I was slightly flattered when I saw on the attendance list today several folks from that office. So 
welcome. Um, the case was FTC v. IVC credit, and the, the case began with a, a lawsuit against a company called Norvergence, which was a telecommunications company that contracted with small businesses, religious and nonprofit organizations to provide savings on phones and internet services through something called the matrix box. The matrix box uh, apparently was as illusory as perhaps the movie, The Matrix, the judge actually used that analogy in his opinion. Um, IFC credit didn't sell the uh, boxes, but it did purchase the contract that consumers had used to finance the uh, purchases of their matrix box matrix boxes and uh, Norvergence ended up going in, into bankruptcy there were class actions filed against it and the FTC then sued IFC for continuing uh, essentially the harm that Norvergence had caused by selling uh, in a deceptive manner, according to the FTC, these matrix boxes. And it, it focused on two aspects of the uh, IFC conduct. One, that IFC continued to represent to customers that they were obligated to pay uh, the rental agreements, claiming that the payments are for the device, not the services, and the, the services were essentially not being provided because the boxes didn't work. Um, and that IFC had acted unfairly by accepting the uh, collection of funds for devices that it, it knew did not work. IFC was um, well represented, and those lawyers uh, alleged, or no, I'm sorry, alleged, they challenged the FTC's complaint and motion to dismiss, arguing that uh, the people, the small businesses who had purchased the matrix boxes and who had financed them were businesses, not consumers. And um, as, as I noted, in a case really of first impression, I think a case really of only impression, the court found that uh, these small businesses were in fact consumers. And in getting there, the, the court, I think, found it took a somewhat circuitous route. It, it found that Black Law Dictionary, which talked about a consumer being someone who buys something for personal use, didn't control, but rather the, the Merriam-Webster Dictionary, which said a consumer is someone who consumes something, should control. And overarching all of the, the court's reasoning in this was a, a desire by the court, I think, to, to protect the small businesses that had, had been allegedly harmed here and deferring to the FTC as an expert agency that supposedly should be deferred to in uh, interpreting the scope of its own statute, what some would call Chevron deference. And the, the court in this case gave it Great deference. One of the arguments that the defendants made that the court rejected was uh, a comparison to the Magnuson Moss Warranty Act. The, the Magnuson Moss Warranty Act says that a consumer is someone who purchases a consumer good. Consumer in that statute is not defined, but a consumer good is, and it's something that someone purchases for personal use. And the court found that a, you know, by way of analogy, found that a business could be a consumer for purposes of the Magnuson Moss Act if what it purchased was essentially a consumer good. So I, I think that reasoning sort of illustrates the, the length to which the court went to try and find that the uh, FTC's authority in, included uh, the businesses that had purchased the. Uh, matrix boxes and had financed financed those boxes, and for which IFC was attempting to collect. Since then, and actually before then, um, the FTC has continued to uh, try and 
protect consumers in that way. And, and Deborah's going to talk to you for a few minutes about some of the more recent efforts that the FTC has undertaken. Great. Thanks, Len. Um, so as Len mentioned before, um, the FTC relies on its Section 5 authority to police business-to-business -business activities. Um, and a major initiative that they took semi-recently in 2018 was Operation Main Street where the FTC partnered with other law enforcement agencies like the U.S. Attorney's Office, um, state AGs, um, and a few others, and all together brought 24 civil and criminal actions um, um, involving defendants who allegedly perpetrated scams against small businesses. Um, there are a variety of scams that were brought um, for example, there was an unordered merchandise scams where defendants try to charge consumers for toner, um, cleaner, other office supplies that they never actually ordered. Um, there's imposter scams where defendants use deceptive tactics such as claiming that they're affiliated with a government or private entity um, in order to trick consumers into paying for corporate materials or filings, registrations, or various fees. Um, there are scams involving robocalls, um, for example, calling businesses and offering them loans or vacation packages, um, and then also scams involving fake invoices that are sent to small businesses um, in which the defendants try to coerce companies into paying for products that they never actually receive. Um, and another component of Operation Main Street was an educational component um, along with the BBB um, in order to educate companies on scams that are perpetrated against these small businesses. Um, so one Operation Main Street case here, just for an example, is the FTC versus Starwood Consulting, which involves mailers that were designed to look like government invoices. So the FTC, along with the Florida AG's office, brought an action um, against three companies and their CEO for Section 5 violations, as well as Florida UDAP violations um, against new small businesses, which were defined as consumers in the complaint. Um, the FTC alleged that these defendants who were not a part um, of or affiliated with any government agency um, or authority sent these mailers to businesses that directed them to pay for labor law posters. Um, and warn them that any failure to comply with posting these regulations would lead to government fines. Um, <laughs> excuse me. The complaint alleged that the defendants received more than $800,000 for more than 9,000 businesses when these posters are actually um, available for free from a government agency. So here, the Section 5 violations were misrepresentations that were made to these small businesses. Um, in order to induce payments, mainly that uh, the defendants were affiliated with a government agency, that these consumers were legally required to purchase these labor law posters from the defendants, um, and that the consumers owe them money for these posters. Uh, the defendants settled with the FTC and Florida AG um, and imposed judge judgments more than $8 million so in reality, uh, most of that was suspended, so the defendants only had to pay $1.2 million of that judgment. Um, and it also banned the defendants from sending unsolicited direct mail to consumers, um, as well as banned them from misrepresenting themselves as a government agency. Um, a more recent case, which was from February of this year, um, was the FCC versus Production Media Company. And here, two Oregon-based media production companies and their owner allegedly uh, deceptively pitched, quote unquote, exclusive advertising placements to small businesses and misled uh, these businesses about when the ads would actually be printed. Um, so they would call companies um, and told these businesses for a small fee, they could place an advertisement in a folder that was used by real estate offices and schools, giving them exposure. Um, in fact, these folders with the ads were either never printed or were only printed after a business complained to the BBB or state AG. Um, and they were also, these ads were also, uh, these folders included ads by more than one competitor, despite um, the defendant's promise of exclusivity. 
Um, and whenever asked for a refund, defendants typically would not issue the refund. And they relied on a fine print in a form that con contradicted what was actually told to the businesses over the phone. Um, so here, the Section 5 violation was the defendant's misrepresentations of exclusivity, again, either expressly, or, either expressed or implied that a consumer's advertisement in the folder would be an exclusive ad for the consumer's line of business. Um, and the second uh, Section 5 violation was misrepresentations of timing for the printing and distributing. Um, they were told, the consumers were told that if they purchased an ad, it would be printed and distributed in a folder either imminently or within a specific time frame of which they were not. So the order entered there banned the defendants from this deceptive conduct and imposed a $22 million judgment against them, um, of which not all $22 million needed to be paid. Um, and with that, I'm turning back to Len for the next slide. Thank you, Deborah. I should mention that in the IFC case, um, shortly after the motion to dismiss was denied, that case was settled as part of a omnibus settlement that also involved multiple investigations by various attorneys general, state attorneys general. And the, the, the nub of the settlement was that uh, IFC could no longer collect on those finance contracts that it had purchased, except in very, very exceptional circumstances. And to, to underscore uh, one of the points that, that Deborah made, I mean, the scope of activities that the uh, FTC has challenged uh, in the business to business space is quite broad. It includes business directory scams, uh, certifications that are sold to businesses for things like data security and integrity, uh, cramming you know, unauthorized phone charges or internet charges, data breaches which harmed businesses, business debt collection, selling to businesses products with deceptive statements, including to, to medical professionals, uh, phony domain name registration, the use of phony endorsements in selling certain uh, business intelligence products, that's the Spokio case, a lot of cases involving uh, fundraising from businesses, um, which was allegedly done uh, fraudulently or deceptively. Allegations regarding, uh, as Beverly mentioned ago, people in, uh, posing falsely or serving as imposters for, for government positions, invention promotion, and office supplies, again, uh, phone or toner cases where people would phone up and try and sell toner or other office supplies to um, businesses. Payment processing uh, where merchants were sold, businesses were sold, payment processing services and the fees or terms of that were not adequately disclosed. Uh, subscriptions to uh, various business pro periodicals or alleged periodicals, some of them were illusory, that where the terms were not disclosed adequately, and then telephony or, or internet services. So um, before I forget, let me give you the uh, CLE code. It is SEC 2020. Again, the CLE code is FTC 2020. So one of the questions that um, we've been asked by, by clients who are trying to figure out whether um, their business is covered by the FTC and just trying to understand sort of you know, where the guardrails are is, you know, at what point does a business uh, become small enough that it's uh, something the FTC feels it needs to protect or at what point does it become big enough that the FTC uh, feels it doesn't need to protect? and the, I don't think there's a, a clear answer um, in trying to negotiate consent decrees with the FTC in several cases where we tried to get a definition of consumer that would um, have some, some definition about what, it, what size business would qualify as a consumer of the FTC 
assiduously uh, resisted that and avoided that and, and would simply not define what a consumer is. It's, um, I, I suppose a, a bit like uh, Justice Stewart's definition of obscenity. Um, he knows it when he sees it. I think the FTC view is they, they know a consumer when they see it. If you look at you know SBA, Small Business Administration guidelines, a small business um, can have annual receipts as low as $1 million to as high as $41.5 million and an employee count between 100 or 1,500 employees. Those are caps, um, depending on the sector in which the, the business operates. Whether those caps are something to which the FTC would defer in determining whether a business is a consumer is um, you know, unclear that they haven't haven't done that. There was a case filed recently, uh, FTC versus Fleet Corps, uh, filed in the Northern District of Georgia towards the end of last year. And and the allegations there would lead you to think that the businesses that the FTC believes it needs to protect are uh, not necessarily just the little mom and pops. Uh, Fleet, Co Fleet Corps. Excuse me, markets fleet cards, cards that um, people who drive vehicles for a company, whether they're repair vans or cars used by salesmen who are out making calls, can use to purchase fuel. And you know, as the name impose, applies, these are sold to companies that have a fleet of vehicles, not simply one vehicle. The FTC alleged that Fleet Corps had um, overcharged millions of dollars in fees to, consume, uh, to consumers, small businesses. Um, and they also alleged that um, these were not just small, but also medium-sized customers do not achieve these savings. And you know, discovery is ongoing in that case, and it'll be curious to see where those lines get drawn by the FTC. One of the allegations in the complaint there is that if a large business uh, noticed that it was being charged certain fees and objected, Fleet Corps would waive those fees. However, um, that would not be the case if um, it was a smaller business. They might reduce them, but they certainly wouldn't waive them. And the FTC has also alleged that Fleet Corps would impose certain, quote, high-risk fees, close quote, on certain small businesses um, without adequately disclosing those. So as I said, discovery in that case, pending in the Northern District of Georgia, is ongoing. And it will be interesting to see if, at summary judgment or otherwise, there are um, some guardrails set up as to what constitutes a uh, what size business constitutes a consumer for purposes of the FTC's claims in that litigation? One of the areas where the FTC has been especially active in uh, protecting small business is in uh, the financing sector. And um, as we'll talk about uh, for quite a bit, uh, the remainder of the term today, I think that that's going to continue and probably increase given the challenges that many small businesses are facing as a result of COVID-19. Um, there are lots of mom and pop shops who um, are in you know, dire situations and when either consumers or small businesses are in those kinds of situations, the FTC historically has acted to um, step in to, to try and protect them. I mean, you think about the Great Recession and all the efforts that the FTC put on payday lending, debt consolidation, mortgage foreclosure rescue. I think you'll see similar efforts now on alleged scams targeting businesses. In 
and it's interesting when Maureen Olhausen was the acting chairman, she she quite publicly said that that protecting small businesses was one of um, her. Uh, she wanted that to be one of the real initiatives of of her term. Her term did not last um, probably as long as she wanted, but that initiative appears to have continued under the stewardship of, of Chairman Simons. So in May of last year, the FTC hosted a forum on small business financing that examined uh, trends and consumer protection issues in the small business financing marketplace, and, and especially in the online sector, which is sort of where the uh, the action is, uh, you know, in, I think in the small business financing arena. And topics that were considered included, you know, online lenders that offer a loan or credit arrangements that resemble traditional bank loans or lines of credit, but also finance providers that provide uh, financing with different features, flat fees instead of interest, and instead of interest rates, and, and higher cost products, including merchant cash advances that, allow, that uh, are offered to higher risk business owners or businesses with, with low credit scores. And in, February of this year, the FCC issued a report from that forum. And I think as you'll see, that, that report in some ways was a precursor to some enforcement that has already occurred. And I, and I believe it is a precursor to, to further enforcement that you'll, um, that, that you'll see down the road. <laughs> Excuse me. The, the report, uh, makes a, a great deal of observations about the small business finance market and who the service providers are. It emphasizes the FTC's broad jurisdiction over commercial financing. And the report refers to small business borrowers as consumers, it talks about the benefits of online lending and discusses the consumer protection concerns. As far as the benefits of online lending to small businesses, the report recognizes the speed and convenience that accessing credit uh, online can provide to small businesses. They also recognize that some of these more innovative and non-traditional financing mechanisms can broaden access to credit for businesses that are struggling both in the amounts that can be financed, the terms, and repayment options. However, the, the report also recognizes that there are concerns with these products. Um, as I think I mentioned earlier, you know, the Truth in Lending Act and the TILA box, which sets forth you know, the, the basic terms of a consumer finance transaction, you know, the interest rate, minimum payments, all those types of key terms, does not apply to business finance arrangements. And reading between the lines in the uh, FTC report, you know, I think the FTC in some ways will try and use its deceptive deception and unfairness authority to push uh, business financiers, financiers to uh, to have something equivalent to a TILA box and, and to standardize perhaps how business finance arrangements are uh, provided. Because if you look at the concerns that the FCC voiced, they were that information is uh, provided in either an inconsistent fashion or that the information is is inconsistent There was uh, concerns that finance providers use widely differing methods for calculating, describing the key features of the product, preventing small business owners from an ability to make uh, apples to apples comparisons. There was at the uh, seminar, uh, at the forum, a lot of discussion and disagreement really over what the best method was. There were several self-regulatory proposals put forward and there was also reference to a California law, which actually requires something akin to a TILA box in uh, 
making small business loans. And there was also uh, concerns voiced by the FTC that there was confusion among small businesses about the features of the financing, including you know, the amount of fees, the uh, savings that uh, a business could achieve by either paying early or using other aspects of the financial product, the amount that had to be paid, and, and what the rates were, including whether uh, an annual interest rate, you know, annual percentage rate APR is actually the, the right tool to use in, in talking about short-term uh, financing. There were several cautions uh, in the staff report, and a lot of them, <coughs> excuse me, focused on a uh, payment device that, uh, financing device, merchant cash advance, advances, which is, uh, you know, I think something that, that's a, a burgeoning financial tool for uh, small businesses. Essentially, you take a loan against your receivables that are going to come through your, typically at your credit card account. In some ways, and I think the FCC probably would like this analogy, it's, it's the equivalent to a, a payday loan for businesses. And a payday loan, a consumer essentially pledges his next paycheck or her next paycheck in exchange for the loan. And in a merchant cash advance, future receivables are pledged against the cash advance. Um, there, it's akin to, you know, companies that used to factor accounts receivable in, in sort of business to business transactions, but here many of the transactions are that uh, are being used to uh, collateralize the debt are uh, business to consumer transactions. Concerns that the FTC expressed about this uh, financing tool were, were high cost, high rates, and, and also certain fees um, that either take the place or in addition to the rates. The FTC was concerned about aggressive and potentially misleading marketing practices, including the, the uh, lead generation that uh, would generate uh, sales in this area. And again, I, I, I think the payday loan uh, analogy is apt here. There were people I've spoken with at the Federal Trade Commission who thought that the, the root of an enormous percentage of the cases that they brought were overly aggressive uh, lead generation for online payday loans. And I think on the business to business side, they would probably view the same thing for merchant, merchant cash advances. Another criticism the FTC had about the mer merchant cash advance sector was the failure to provide uh, data to <clears throat> the merchant customers that would reconcile what was owed, what had been paid, and that uh, true up. I mean, the amount that is to be deducted from the incoming uh, receivables is supposed to vary with the volume, the amount of the receivables, and in certain instances, the FTC believes that that doesn't happen so that the uh, lender is taking more than its fair share of, uh, you know, the receivables that are coming in. There were also concerns about, you know, potentially abusive collection practices, including the use of confessions of judgment. <coughs> um, and again, you know, this is an area where the Fair Debt Collection Practices Act does not apply to business debt, uh, also would not apply to, to first party as opposed to third party debt. But I think this is an area where you're gonna see the FTC using its unfairness authority or in, in certain instances, its deception authority to um, police uh, improper collection efforts uh, related to merchant cash advances or even related to other types of uh, business financing. And on, on the lead generation, just as with any other uh, marketing, you know, whether it's dietary supplements, financial products, work at home opportunities, you know, it's, it's really important that the ultimate provider of the service <clears throat> make sure that their marketers 
are not generating leads with promises that the marketer can't fulfill. And that's as true for merchant cash advance as it is for someone selling uh, dietary supplements. So th that's uh, the, the financing report. Deborah is now going to talk to you about a case that came not too long after that report and that mirrors some of the themes uh, in that report. Great. Thank you, Len. Um, oh, um, so, yeah, so just in the beginning of June, um, the FTC brought, brought a case um, against RCG Advances. Um, so here, two New York-based companies um, and several owners and officers um, allegedly violated Section 5, again, of the FTC Act for their deceptive business financing activities. Um, their target was small businesses and medical offices, nonprofit organizations, <laughs> excuse me, um, and religious organizations. So exactly the type of consumers that Len and I have been discussing. Um, so the entities were deceived by misrepresentations um, about the terms of the merchant cash advances. Um, and then uh, the RCG using unfair collection practices against them. Um, so advertisements falsely claim that the defendant's cash advances required no personal guarantee um, and the financing required no upfront costs, and that wasn't uh, the case. They also allegedly used signed confessions of judgment um, that required um, by contract for them to seize business and personal assets. Um, and then these companies were, excuse me, these customers were threatened when the payments weren't actually made. Um, uh, funds were also withdrawn from bank accounts with the, without the consumer's um, expressed informed consent. So again, it's talk, it, it was a case brought um, about these merchant cash advances that the FTC seemed to be kind of focusing on as it was a major focus of the um, forum that uh, Len just spent some time discussing. Um, and also, as Len mentioned earlier, small business financing during COVID-19, which I think makes um, a lot of sense. So in May, just last month, the FTC and the FDA sent joint warning letters to companies, including lead generators, um, about their claims of affiliation with FDA-administered programs for emergency relief. And I think most people naturally think of the Paycheck Protection Program um, that was designed to help small businesses keep their employees um, or other SBA loans that are offered. And so small businesses apply for these PPP loans through SBA authorized lenders or lenders that the SBA has determined to be eligible. So the FTC brought a case um, in April against a company that was doing business as SBA loan program, which essentially they were preying on small businesses that sought financial relief from the pandemic. Um, they were marketing themselves as an approved lender. Um, so they claimed to make funds available to small businesses through federal legislation when they weren't actually authorized to make or approve these loans. Um, they would call these small businesses claiming to be representatives um, from the SBA and soliciting loan applications on behalf of the businesses' banks. Um, they also had statements on their website saying uh, things like, we are a direct lender for the PPP program. So fully closing themselves out there um, to solicit applications for the PPP loans. Um, the FTC alleged that hundreds, if not thousands, of businesses submitted loan applications to the defendants. I mean, as I'm sure we all know, these PPP loans went out pretty quickly, so they weren't able to get them it could potentially destroy um, a business. So here, um, the Section 5 violation was misrepresentation um, of, the, of the company's authorization to actually make the loans and accept or process these PPP loans. Um, and the other Section 5 misrepresentation, the other Section 5 violation was misrepresentation um, concerning their government status um, that this company said that they are. Um, affiliated with the SBA or um, connected to it. 
So the FTC here asked the court to immediately um, have this company stop making their um, misrepresentations about their loans and their government status. Um, so the FTC is clearly on top of companies that are using this time to try and get um, what they want from these small businesses. Um, so the FTC and the SBA can continue to monitor companies that falsely claim an affiliation with the SBA or that they are approved PPP lender or that they may or that a company may falsely represent that people can get PPP loans or other SBA loans um, by applying through their website. Just a few days ago, um, on June 24th, the FTC sent additional letters to six companies urging them to look at their marketing materials and remove any deceptive or misleading statements, again, about their ability to provide these loans or their affiliation with SBA. Um, and the FTC isn't just looking um, on what a company might say on their website. They're also looking at their social media, so um, all claims need to be um, vetted. So again, uh, small business protection during COVID in general, beyond just small business financing, um, the FTC always has authored blogs on what businesses should look out for, um, but specifically during coronavirus time, on their specific business-to-business -business scams that the FTC suggested companies keep an eye out for. Um, that includes public health scams where someone may send a message claiming to be from the CDC or the World Health Organization or any other public health office um, where they ask for personal or business information or they may email links um, to steal confidential data or install malware. Um, there's also government check scams which I think we can figure out where people call businesses out of the blue and claim there might be money available from a government agency if the business makes an upfront payment or provides personal um, information. There's also business email scams and IT scams, which are something businesses always should be aware of, where a spoofed email address might, um, you might get um, an email from a CEO and think that you have to do something. Um, which people under normal circumstances might be wary of, but during a time where there may be real unusual requests being made, um, people might not be as conscious of checking out what might be fraud or might be a real request, especially with people working from home and unable to actually go in and check with the person who sent them an email asking if it was legitimate. So. These are always concerns, these business email scams and IT scams, but especially um, during a time like this. There's also supply scam potential where you might get a call that someone has an essential item for you, but in reality, they're just taking an order, getting your credit card information, and essentially stealing your financial information from this business. Again, robocall scams where um, a small business might be targeted to pitch that someone has a fake test kit or has sanitation supplies, um, when in reality they don't. Um, and then uh, data scams where um, it's easier for a fraudster to hack when someone's working from home. So a lot of these are con are taken when people are not in the office together or working from home uh, where these scams like have a better chance of occurring. Um, so the FTC has published this blog and several others to point out um, scams that small businesses and really any business should be conscious of. Um, and I will turn it back to Len. Thanks, Deborah. Um, one small point that I wanted to mention about the RCG case, because it's colorful, and Deborah mentioned that there were threats to customers when payments weren't made. But the nature of those threats are not something you would typically see in an FTC case. The threats were along the lines of, if you don't pay us, we're going to break your jaw. That's typically a more the Bronx DA than the uh, FTC, but uh, nonetheless, I thought that was worth sharing. If folks have questions, 
um, we've got one or two in the chat, but, but please submit them by the chat because um, the, the hour is going quickly and we'll try to get to as many of them as we can. Um, so key, key takeaways here. Um, you know, I, I think you know, the FTC will use its Section 5 authority to go after business to business conduct that it um, it might not be able to, for example, you know, the, the FTC doesn't have TILA jurisdiction over businesses, but I think it will try and use those principles through its Section 5 authority to make sure that uh, financing is described accurately and in a manner generally consistent with the Truth and Lending Act. Same thing for the, the Fair Debt Collection Practices Act. And, you know, the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau is limited to truly uh, consumer conduct. So I think you would see some coordination between those two agencies. If the CFPB sees conduct that it can't reach, it, it would steer that towards the FTC. I, I think the concerns outlined in the uh, February, from, from the February uh, symposium on, on online uh, small business lending will guide a fair amount of future enforcement. We saw that in the RCG case, which sort of checked almost all the boxes of the FTC's concern. But I, I think you will see other <clears throat> cases uh, in the merchant cash advance uh, ar arena. I, I think you'll see enforcement in um, payment processing where uh, payment processors dealing with merchants and sort of disclosing fees and, and other aspects of the uh, payment processing relationship or the equipment leasing relationship for that are, are likely to be things that, that you will see. One question that we, we have gotten so far is if we could talk about the scope uh, of the FTC as it relates to marketing claims by larger businesses, smaller businesses, is there an expectation that marketing communication should be as compliant to small business marketing as normally done with consumers. And ask about the definition of a reasonable consumer using disclaimers, debt plus substantiation, et cetera. So, you know, a reasonable consumer is in the eyes of the beholder. But, you know, if you look at the FTC's cases generally, there is particular attention paid by the FTC where the consumer, in, at least in the FTC's view, is somewhat desperate. So that goes for everything from weight loss, where you know, claim, miracle claims of weight loss. You know, people are, especially after COVID, desperate to lose some weight. Um, miracle cures. You know, and it, you know, people who are have medical conditions that. Um, you know, are they having difficulty with them? I and the FTC routinely goes after companies that uh, make phony cancer cures, diabetes cures, you know, payday loans, mortgage foreclosure rescue, uh, debt consolidation or, or debt elimination. You know, all businesses that are selling to consumers who um, are somewhat desperate and the FTC's concern is that because those consumers are somewhat desperate, in some instances very desperate, the ability of that consumer to discern um, what's really going on, to read the fine print, to read the disclaimers, to, to, to be truly reasonable is, is somewhat suspect. And so the government feels it needs to step in to protect them. I think all of those principles would apply as the FTC thinks about what it needs to do to protect small businesses or medium-sized businesses. So I think the the more arm's length and negotiated a transaction is, the less the less the FTC is going to be involved. On the other hand, if um, the goods or services that are being offered are being offered to businesses that are on um, their last legs due to the pandemic or, or due to anything else, you know, uh, financing with uh, very aggressive terms that um, may not be well spelled out. You know, I think that's an area where you're going to see the uh, FTC uh, continue to be active. Uh, financing or relief of some sorts that 
purports to be from the government to help small businesses. I think you're going to see the FTC to continue to be active there. So I don't think it's a, it's a black and white issue. I think it's, it's more of a continuum. But, you know, as you're thinking about what claims you might be able to make or how you're going to present, present an offer, you know, I, I think a, a good rule of, of thumb is to think about whether the FTC is going to believe that that small business, that medium-sized business you're marketing to, is not well positioned to evaluate the veracity of what you're saying and needs extra protection so that the FTC will try and sweep aside disclaimers or fine print disclosures that, that might clarify the, the offer. And again, I think it's really important, given the emphasis on this in the, um, the report the FTC issued, be monitoring what your lead generators are, are doing because the FTC's view of that world is that if the lead generator makes a false statement that starts the consumer down the road um, of purchasing your product, you're stuck with what that lead generator said, even if you subsequently try and fix it. Now, you know, may, there may be circumstances where you can do that, but you're starting behind if the uh, <clears throat> lead generation is, is making uh, statements that it should not be. Uh, I don't know that we've gotten any other questions. We have a little bit of time for them if anyone's got them. And I will remind you that the CLE code is FTC 2020. Any other questions? Going once. I'll give another minute. And uh, I'll put a plug in for our next uh, webinar, which is on July 23rd, uh, on key copyright guidelines to help with your marketing and sales department, making sure they stay out of trouble. Deborah, anything to add in closing? No, I, I think we got it all. All right. Well, thank you all for attending. Um, I hope everyone stays uh, safe and healthy. And uh, look forward to talking to you all again soon. Thank you very much.